Homer Bernard Wilson Jr. was an exceptional aeronautical engineer, humanitarian, philanthropist, and educator. He was born in Hogansville, Georgia on December 27, 1925, and he passed away in his 87th year on March 29, 2012 at his home in Lacey Springs, Alabama. Mr. Wilson was a member of the Werner Von Braun team at Redstone Arsenal where he worked on the Saturn V rocket that took man to the moon and on the space shuttle. Mr. Wilson founded Aerothermal Technology in 1989, a defense contracting firm now headed by his daughter, Wendy Wilson. He worked tirelessly throughout his life to help the disadvantaged, including orphanages, churches, and schools in developing countries. He founded Friends of the Children, a charitable foundation to assist the children of Guatemala. Mr. Wilson loved to fly and to teach others to fly. After his death, the Homer B. Wilson Jr. Vintage Museum was formed as a nonprofit organization to preserve vintage aircraft and promote general aviation. The museum provides historical exhibits, aviation education, and a firsthand experience with vintage aircraft and equipment. Over the years, Mr. Wilson collected 10 vintage aircraft and numerous examples of equipment which are now on exhibit at the museum. This film introduces each of these aircraft and takes you aloft in one of them that served as a primary trainer for pilots in all military branches during World War II, including the Tuskegee Airmen. Bill Greenhaw, Executive Director of the Vintage Museum, will be your guide and pilot. This is a 1941 Stearman. Steer, this particular Stearman was built by the Boeing Company and at the time this was built, it was a, um, Stearman was a subsidiary of the Boeing Company. This was built to compete for the primary contract during World War II for the primary trainer contract. And it won the contract and it was designated by the military as a PT-17. Uh, this one has a Continental. W670 series engine, it'll develop about 220 horsepower, and it's not overpowered for this particular airplane. This particular airplane was one of the ones that it was Tuskegee, Alabama, and it was used to train the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, Tuskegee Airmen don't like to talk about Stearman too much because they got their fame in red tail P-51s, but anyway, before they flew the P-51, all of them started out flying the Stearman. All right, this is a 1946 Piper Cub. You've heard of Piper Cub all your life, and, and this is one. Uh, it has a 65 horsepower engine on it. The engine was made by Continental. It burns about four gallons of gas an hour. It, uh, the pilot sits in the uh, back seat and the passenger sits in the front seat of this particular airplane. You can fly it with the door closed, you can fly it with the door open. When I first started flying these airplanes, I was told that you take off at 60, you cruise at 60, you land at 60. If you can remember the numbers, you can fly the airplane. <laughs> but it's a good flying little airplane and we got it restored for Mr. Wilson and, and started flying it in 2008. And it's one of the more popular airplanes for the photographers, especially those with the large cameras. They like to go up in this one where they have plenty of room to take the pictures they need to get. This is a 1929 Travel Air. Travel Air was a company that was owned by Walter Beach, Clyde Cessna, and Lloyd Stearman. Lloyd Stearman was the designer. So you see a lot of similarities between this airplane and the Stearman that we have here. Uh, some of the differences between this airplane and the Stearman, you can see that the aileron is on the top wing for this airplane, it's on the bottom wing for the Stearman. We were told by the person that, that uh, restored this airplane, it was restored by Martin Lowe up in Culpeper, Virginia. We were told by Mr. Lowe that, that uh, this airplane was originally owned by Olive Van Hammond. Olive Van Hammond went on and married Walter Beach. During World War II, uh, Walter Beach became ill and Olive Van Hammond ran the Beach Aircraft Company during World War II. In later years, 
uh, Mr. Beach retained his health and he took back uh, president and CEO of the company for a few years. And then later when he got terminally ill, Olive Van Hammond ran the Beach Aircraft Company until uh, it was acquired by Raytheon in the mid-1990s. This is a 1943 Stearman. Uh, this particular airplane was obtained from uh, a bank up in Lebanon, Tennessee. Its previous owner was uh, Warbird Sky Ventures Incorporated, and they used the airplane to give aerobatic rides. After World War II, this airplane was used as a crop duster for a number of years, and eventually it became where it wasn't economically feasible to crop dust with a Stearman. So the airplane sat for a while, and then it was restored back to the original configuration and used by Warbird Sky Ventures Incorporated in their, in their business. Um, it has a camera system on it. We find the camera over on the left wing. We find a camera on the cabane on the right side, and we find one on the vertical stabilizer. Uh, these were used to take pictures of the passengers while they were doing their aerobatic rides. Um, the Stearman is an expensive airplane to operate and an expensive airplane to maintain, so uh, Warbird Sky Ventures Incorporated couldn't, couldn't uh, make enough money giving aerobatic rides to pay for the airplane and pay their salaries, so eventually it was repossessed by the bank and it's, Mr. Wilson got it from there. Uh, this particular airplane was used in, as a, uh, it was painted up in uh, Marine Corps colors it's got U.S. Navy on the side because the Marine Corps is the division of the U.S. Navy. Uh, but anyway, the, the Navy airplanes, Navy used this as a primary trainer also during World War II, but theirs were painted yellow. And the Army Air Corps used them as primary trainers, and theirs was painted as in uh, blue fuselage and yellow wings, yellow wings and yellow empennage. This is a 1946 AirCoop. AirCoop is an acronym for Engineering Research Corporation, which was a wholly owned subsidiary of MIT. It was designed and built at, at the end of World War II. At that time, the manufacturers envisioned a big aircraft boom, so there were a lot of people, that, a lot of manufacturers that entered the aircraft market at that time. Uh, this one was designed to be the safest airplane ever built, and uh, Aircoop uh, Engineering Research Corporation envisioned that they would, every family would own one. You can't do an uncoordinated turn on this airplane because the ailerons and the elevators are linked together. When you turn the ailerons, the elevators turn, the, the rudder turns the exact amount. And since it won't do an uncoordinated turn, it won't spin. And you have very limited elevator travel, so if you, um, as long as you have power on there, the airplane won't stall. You can pull the power and the airplane will come down, but as long as you have power on it, it's not going to stall. It'll keep mushing forward. It may li reach a limit where you won't climb anymore, but it won't, it won't stall out of there and fall out of the air on you, as long as you got power on it. This airplane, um, this airplane was not used, not bought by military in significant numbers. But during the Korean War, they, they uh, did buy a few, and they used them for the early research on uh, JATO rockets. They boated some JATO rockets on them to, to do some of the early research to see if the JATOs would get them off the ground in a hurry. JATO is an acronym for Jet Assistant Takeoff. It's where they boat a rocket on the side of your airplane and shoot you up in the air while you're taking off. After World War II, uh, most, of the air, most of the pilots at that time were used to flying P-51s, Corsairs, and more high-performance airplanes. So they distinguished themselves as pilots and the, anybody that flew the air coupe, they called them air coupe drivers. And they gave it a lot of derogatory names. And they call it things like chicken chaser. Because they kind of kind of uh, looked down on people, the, the, the pilots of the time looked down on people that, that uh, flew air coupes.
This is a 1946 Ronica Champ. Ronica Champ was a competitor of Piper Cub during the 1940s. They still built a Ronica Champ. It has a different engine and, and a few modifications to it, but still it's basically the same airplane that you see right here. Uh, this one, uh, the difference between the Piper Cub and this airplane is in this airplane, the pilot sits up front and in the Piper Cub, the pilot sits in the back. This one has a 65 horsepower engine like the Piper Cub. It burns about four gallons an hour. It doesn't have a starter, it doesn't have a battery, it doesn't have radios, it doesn't have lights, you can't fly it at night. You have to, to start it using the propeller, just turn in the propeller and stay out of the way. Um, this airplane was bought from um, Richard Trulson's widow after Richard Trulson died. Uh, Richard was moving some houses, some buildings, uh, on his farm and one fell on him and, and cut his legs off. He modified this airplane where he could fly it with hand controls. And he flew it with hand controls until he died of a heart attack a few years later. And then after that, it was put back into the original configuration and it was uh, sold by Richard's widow, Loretta Trilson, to, uh, to Mr. Wilson. This is a replica of a World War I tri-wing Sopwith. Uh, this replica was built in, in the 1990s and it was originally delivered to the, to the World War I museum that Frank Ryder had here during the 1990s. Uh, Mr. Wilson acquired this from the Frank Ryder estate. The, uh, at the beginning of World War I, most of the military airplanes were bi-wings. And um, Volker developed a monowing for Germany, and the monowing was a lot faster, so it could it could uh, catch and shoot down the bowing airplanes pretty easy. So for a while, Germany had air superiority. Well, the British decided instead of trying to build a monowing to compete with the Volker, they built a tri-wing. It's not very fast, but it has ailerons on every wing, so. It's very maneuverable. You know, when the Fokker would come in to do their kill, the, uh, the tri-wing would just outmaneuver it and shoot it down the air, out of the air. The uh, tri-wing was so successful that uh, Fokker went back and developed the tri-wing for Germany. And Frederick von Richthofen, which was the German ace for World War I, he got his kills in a tri-wing Fokker. The propeller on this airplane, you have a machine gun that they used to shoot at other airplanes or they could shoot at the people on the ground. They had a problem in the early days of shooting their propeller off. And if you shoot your propeller off in enemy territory, you're not going to have a good day. So they developed a cam where they could time the machine gun to where it wouldn't shoot when the propeller was in front of it. So they would time, time the, it with the propeller and, and it solved the problem of shooting your propeller off while you're trying to, to uh, have shoot at your, your enemy. This is a 1940 WACO. WACO is an acronym for Wagner Aircraft Company and they still build airplanes today at, in Troy, Ohio. Um, Waco, this particular version of Waco was built, this is a UPF-7. It was built to uh, compete with Boeing and other aircraft manufacturers for the primary contract, primary trainer contract during World War II. This airplane didn't win the primary trainer contract, but the military used a lot of civilian contractors to train military pilots. So this airplane was used a lot by contractors that were training pilots for the military. This particular airplane was used as a trainer during World War II. After World War II, this airplane wound up at Cordell, Georgia, and the person that owned three of them decided they weren't safe airplanes, so he burned them. Uh, the only thing that'll burn essentially is the wings. The rest of it, you can't get it hot enough to damage it even. So um, Mr. Wilson wound up with enough parts to restore one airplane. Mr. Wilson and his daughter Wendy uh, restored the, built the, the ribs and the spars for the ailerons 
in, uh, in, a, in a shop, wood shop that they had. And they hired a person uh, down in, near uh, Columbus, Georgia uh, to restore it for him, a guy by the name of James Birchfield. James uh, worked on the airplane for several years and he became ill and, and, and passed away. And they took the airplane to Culpeper, Virginia and had it finished by uh, Martin Lowe, the person that restored the, the um, travel air. It's a good flying airplane. Uh, I got about 23 hours in it before Mr. Wilson decided he didn't want us to fly it anymore. One of the problems we had with it was the, uh, it's kind of tricky airplane to land. Don't think I ever landed it for what I didn't hear the tire squeal, but it it's, flies really good. It, and other than, one of the main differences between this one and the Stearman, you can get two people in the front seat in this one. You can only get one in the in the Stearman, but the pilot, just like the Stearman, the pilot flies from the back. And the tail wheel on this one is a locking tail wheel. You pull it out on the runway, you lock your tail wheel in whatever direction you're headed, that's the direction you're going until you get enough speed to get your tail wheel off the ground. Once you get your tail wheel off the ground, it tries to rotate with you so you can use your rudder to keep you straight while you're, while you're getting the airplane up in the air. But you leave your tail wheel locked and when you land, you uh, whatever direction you land, once you get the tail wheel down, that's the direction you're going. The only problem I ever had with that is if somebody's coming in behind me is to get the tail wheel unlocked so I could get off the runway. Because if you don't unlock the tail wheel, you're not going to get it off the runway. This is a 1976 Cessna 172. They call it a 172M. It's uh, one of the last years that they put the, the Lycoming uh, series uh, 0320E2D engines in Cessna, and that was a very good engine, probably one of the better ones that, that uh, Cessna ever put in airplanes. Anyway, it's a very reliable engine, very reliable airplane, and this is one that Mr. Wilson had owned for a number of years. He had this one, I guess he bought it new in 1976, and he had owned it. When his children were small, small they would uh, take uh, trips in it to visit relatives, visit grandma and grandpa and, and, uh, for Christmas or whenever. And he also used it uh, as his own personal transportation almost everywhere he went. Um, even, even, after we got, uh, even after he got older and, and began to have medical problems, we would still go visit his brother over in uh, northeast Georgia in, in this particular airplane. We'd fly it over to Gainesville, Georgia and, and uh, visit his brother. It's a good flying little airplane and, and after, his, after Mr. Wilson passed, Mr. Wilson loaned it to the museum and we've kind of used it here as a fundraiser. We would give airplane rides in it and we would, if people would supply their own insurance, we would let them rent the airplane to train in it, get their pilot's license. So uh, it's been a, a workhorse for us it's been a workhorse all its life, so it's, it's a, a, a very good airplane. This is a 1977 model Cessna 150 series. It's, it's our new airplane, so it's a 1977. <laughs> anyway, uh, the airplane was used primarily as a trainer and it was used at Gunnersville for a number of years as a trainer and it was acquired by a gentleman by the name of Jim Foreman who restored it and got it painted and, and made, made it look nice, redid the interior. And then when Mr. Foreman uh, got in his 80s, mid 80s, he decided he didn't want to fly anymore so he sold the airplane to Mr. Wilson. And Mr. Wilson has, has used the airplane some just to ride around here. He did fly a couple of students in this airplane when he was still able to, uh, to give uh, trained pilots to fly, train people to fly. But uh, we've used it some after Mr. Wilson has passed. Uh, we've carried photographers up in it occasionally and let them take pictures if they wanted to. And, and, and we have given a few rides in it uh, take people around the lake and let them view the scenery. It, it has a 100 horsepower Continental engine on it. Continental uh, is an engine manufacturer and it's got the 0200 Continental one and it's 100 horsepower. 
Um, it burns about six gallons of gas an hour. So it's a good airplane just to fly around if, if you're not going anywhere far or don't have to get there fast. There were a lot of 150s built and, and most of them were used to train people how to fly. Every person here has a life story. I believe few could argue that Homer Wilson's life story was larger than usual. Homer taught me to fly. I dare not bore you with all the aviation minutia, but he had a stable of airplanes in different sort of repair. A Waco, a Piper Cub, that three-wing plane that's right there, the Stearman, the two-wing two two plane. I was with him when he got that one in South Carolina. His favorite plane, though, was that Cessna 172, 80807. That's the one he taught me to fly in. I did most of my first 100 hours in that plane. How did aviation come up? During the previous months, coincidentally, my brother and I had talked about doing some aviation. All my life I wanted to do aviation, all my life. And my brother and I were talking about buying a powered parachute. I told Homer all about it, and Homer said, don't buy one of those things, they're dangerous. He said, I'll teach you to fly. I looked at him, he said, I'm a certified flight instructor, FAA flight instructor. Aviators always eventually get, in, get around to talk about aviation. All my life, I was that five-year-old little boy that would look up and see the airplanes going over. I was one of those kids, and Homer realized that. He saw that. He heard that in me, and it wasn't pretend. It wasn't facade. He knew it was that. So he said, if you'll pay for the fuel, I'll teach you to fly. And I was about to sit in the left seat of a Cessna 172, and we were going to fly. Man. The first entry in my logbook with Homer's signature was April the 24th, 1998. I'll never forget it, ever. 1,700 hours ago, Homer's signature is all over my logbook, and I'm so proud of that. Only because of Homer Wilson. An aviator understands. Homer and Mary understood. I have to be 56 years old. I have to be six foot tall and I have to fly. They understood that. With nothing to gain but satisfaction, Homer's goodness initiated my training. Homer's patience created an opportunity and it never wavered. Homer's gravitas provided the equipment and his brilliance encouraged and taught and demanded of me my best effort to learn to fly. And I flew today to come here. Only because of the passion, love, and tutelage, only because of the eccentricities of a man named Homer Wilson did I get my wings. His whole life, both at NASA and elsewhere, was built around the fact that when he saw a need, he would put his whole body, mind, money, and effort behind filling that need. He filled it in me. I'm a direct beneficiary of Homer and Mary's generosity, and I am eternally grateful for that. Eternally grateful for that. Someone much greater than me said it better. No greater love hath man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And that same man said that the world will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. He wasn't a preacher by no stretch. He wasn't perfect by nobody's definition. But that Savior said, the world will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. I experienced that love from Homer Wilson. As Bill Greenhaw said, he always looked on the bright side. He was a dreamer, and a lot of his dreams came true.